Uh, so I'm Andrew Selipak. I'm a lecturer in uh, the Department of Media Production and Management and Technology at the University of Florida. I'm also the program coordinator for the online master's program in social media at the University of Florida. Uh, I have a PhD from the University of Florida in mass communications. I have a master's degree from George Mason University in communications, and my undergraduate degree is from the University of Virginia in American history. Section 230, is it beneficial to citizens? So Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act is essentially what gives us the internet as it exists today. Uh, without Section 230, you would have social media companies, you would have blogs, you'd have websites that would be responsible for every piece of content that any user posts, um, whether it was a dating app, whether it's Facebook, whether it is an Amazon review, whether it's Yelp. Um, it essentially allows every tech company to be seen as not a publisher of content, but sort of a social media platform. Um, and this prevents it from being sued for libel for things that users state. Without Section 230, you would have these essentially tech companies be looked at as newspapers. And as a newspaper, anything that is on that platform posted by anybody, just as if it was a reporter working for a newspaper, that company would be responsible for. So Section 230, going back to the 90s, has essentially created the Internet that we have today. It's created social media as we have it today. And without Section 230, the Internet as we know it would be completely different. Uh, we would be looking at a vastly different online experience. We'd be going back in time to kind of the almost dial-up days of the Internet, um, even maybe kind of the very early dial-up days of the Internet where we just had sort of the bulletin board system. Um, and I don't think that this country or any country could go back to those very early Internet days. Are you in favor of uh, keeping Section 230 the way it is or changing Section 230? I think Section 230, the unintended consequences of getting rid of it, I think are um, often not thought of or not discussed enough um, in terms of what the changes would be. I think Section 230 as it is, um, is something that is vital and necessary for us to have the internet that it exists today. Does that mean that extra rules and regulations can't be put in place? Of course, you know, there's a, a plenty of things that need to be done because Section 230 is also, you know, we're looking at it coming up on being, you know, almost 30 years old. And when it was first passed, it was a vastly different internet than we have today. It wasn't an internet with smartphones. It wasn't an internet with Facebook and these tech companies with multi-billionaire owners. It wasn't an internet where, you know, we were taking pictures on a, a, a phone and we were immediately uploading it to social media or, or uploading it to the web. So it is a bit antiquated in terms of how, when it was passed compared to the internet that we have today, it would almost be the same as if we had laws in place that were regulating horse and buggies and trying to apply that to, you know, a, a, some type of Mustang or Camaro. Uh, it, it's just not quite what it needs to be. But again, I think without it, we wouldn't have gotten to the, the place that we are now with the Internet. And despite all of the problems, the issues, and, and there are some pretty significant ones, um, I, I don't think that we as Internet users could go back to those pre sort of Internet days when we just had the bulletin board system. You know, depending on who's you know watching this, some people may not even remember bulletin boards. Um, and, and for those who don't, believe me, you don't want to go back to the bulletin board days um, where it's basically just I, I will click on a button and it, you know, pre mouse days, really. Uh, and I'll click on, you know, six and that will six will give me a story. And then if I want another story, I'll click on H. That, that is not the Internet that we want to go back to. Um, so, yes, could new laws, new rules, new regulations be passed that would deal with a lot of the issues that we have in tech? A hundred percent. Should we get rid of Section 230? The, again, the unintended consequences and what that would mean, I think, would be devastating for the online experience. And the thing is, I think, you know, you have a lot of people who are saying we need to get rid of Section 230. Section 230 is bad. 
And I think it's just more of a political talking point at this point. Well, or it could be ignorance on the part of the person who's saying it. But I think a lot of it is a political talking point to try to be an attack on big tech without actually doing anything. Um, I, I think if you were to actually get down into trying to get rid of Section 230 and if it was Congress attempting to do it, you know, we could already see that Congress has a hard time passing something as simple as our bridges are falling down. We should probably raise some money to pay for bridges to not fall down. Uh, you know, they struggle with that. Getting rid of the Internet as it exists and the impact it would have. I think them passing a law to do that or, or overruling or overturning or that, you know, doing anything to it are most likely not going to happen. But then again, I don't know if we can really put anything past Congress at this point either. Consumer reviews. Reviews are important to consumers. They have been proven, there are numerous studies that show it. Do you, I would say you are very well educated in social media. Do you believe in reviews? Do you trust reviews? You know, I think it's one of those things where it's a grain of salt. Um, you know, I definitely will look at them. Uh, I, I would say that, uh, you know, you, you again, kind of have to think about where it came from. Um, and and there's, there's reviews on everything anymore. Uh, you know, you, you look at a product on Amazon, there's reviews. You look at a product on Walmart, there's reviews. Um, you look at Yelp, there are reviews on there. Um, you know, TripAdvisor, there are reviews on there. I've left uh, my own Google reviews. Uh, I actually made, did a review on TripAdvisor just this past weekend. So I know I post them. Uh, I'm not saying I do it very often. I'd probably say over the years I've done less than 10, um, but you know, I've done them. And I will go through them, you know, but a big part for me is not necessarily looking at the comments that people left. Um, it's more looking at some of the visuals that people left, especially if I'm using something like TripAdvisor. Um, you know, I want to see what the place is going to look like before I travel to it. But I, I know that these reviews sometimes are some, sometimes useless. So again, it kind of goes back to you know, that media literacy aspect of when you're looking at these reviews, why do you decide to trust one over the other? Is it just one experience one person had? Is it part of a trend? Um, you know, we can see these reviews every time you want to download a new app and you, know, you can read the reviews there. If it's, um, you know, you can go to the Better Business Bureau and you can look at the reviews there. I, I will say that not anecdotally, but on a personal level, uh, last year, I was prepared to buy a new house and there was a, a neighborhood I, I liked. The, the price of the house was kind of fit within my budget and looked up the builder on um, Better Business Bureau's website and saw just a horrible reviews left for them um, and shared it with my real estate agent. And I was like, you know, this builder really has some terrible reviews. They said, well, let's go take a look at, you know, their model homes, which were in another town. They didn't have any models here in this town. And we went to go look at their model homes. And he and I were both just kind of shocked that these were the houses that they picked to be model homes. And we just saw a number of problems that all kind of matched the, the some of the reviews that were left on the Better Business Bureau site. And, you know, that's the thing, like, you know, what you see online should not become gospel to you. Um, what you see online is something that you should cross-reference, that, you know, you should maybe check for yourself. Um, you, you can't, I don't want to say you can't trust the internet, but it's, um, you know, trust but verify, I think is uh, sort of the, the common phrase. You know, you, you don't want to just go to WebMD and get one, you know, kind of do one search result. So like I have an itch under my arm and, you know, it's under your arm. You have cancer. It's like, oh my God, I have cancer now because I have an itch under my arm. It's like, no, maybe you scratched yourself. You know, maybe you, know, maybe you should switch deodorants. There could be lots of other reasons. It might not be cancer. Um, so it, it is that idea of, you know, you got to be smart when you're using the internet. And, um, you know, that includes reviews. But, you know, I, I think we would all agree that sometimes we're not the smartest Internet users. Uh, and if there's something we can definitely agree on is that other people 
are not the smartest internet users. In your personal opinion, do you trust more positive reviews or negative reviews? Or you think they are identically mixed of truthfulness and falseness? I think it, it's, again, one of the things that you have to look at is what, what is it on balance? So if I'm reading reviews for a product, if I'm reading reviews for a destination, if I'm reading reviews for a restaurant, generally, you know, you can see how many five-star reviews and one-star reviews there are. Well, I mean, that to me kind of is one of the first things to look at. If it's got, you know, an even number of fives and ones, that's probably not a good thing. If it's, you know, got a lot more ones than it does fives, that's also probably not a good thing. But we do know that, and and maybe we're going to touch on it in a second here, that with things like cancel culture, um, you might see a bunch of one reviews, not because you have people who've actually gone into that business or have any experience with that business, but it's just maybe the owner or an employee there said something and now people are flooding it with bad reviews. Um, But I, I think the major thing is, again, you know, taking that aspect out for a second um, you know, I think if you see something where the, the reviews seem to be on the two extremes, you know, it's, it's fives and ones, that would kind of lead me to believe that there's maybe it's not so much the product being reviewed. It's, you know, maybe the person, the owner on the, the cancel culture side, um, you know, because people can have OK experiences. You know, not everything has to be horrible or fantastic. You you could go into a place or you could buy a product and you're like, yeah, it was fine. Like, it I didn't pay for a lot for it. So for what it was worth, yeah, okay. Um, So I think a lot of it is, you know, there's kind of the quantitative side and the qualitative side. Like how many fives and ones do we have? And what are the quality of the reviews that are being left? And and kind of perusing some of those reviews and seeing what people are saying in terms of the actual words and not just, you know, the end of the day, like how many stars something got. Uh, Because there's a lot of different things that can go into that. And I guess if we look at it from an even larger perspective, we're kind of now placing some trust in the Internet and on the website that we're looking at that they have accurately provided all of the reviews. I mean, we, we could get into a much bigger question right there. How do you feel about a company that does not publish all the negative reviews, publishes only the positive reviews and just remove the hides from public view of the negativity that people have posted about them. I think there's a lot of things that go into that. One is, you know, if, if you go, if the company itself is providing the reviews, um, I, I would be willing to bet that they're only going to provide the best reviews. You know, if, if I am literally in charge of the content that I'm providing and it's my website, I'm not going to list, yeah, this customer said that uh, you know, my product's terrible. And this customer over here said that the service was terrible. There, there, there's no, I, I, I would be willing to bet there's not a company in the United States that would be you know, showcasing their terrible reviews. Um, it, it seems to go uh, literally against what we would think of with brand building. Um, you know, we only get, you know, five-star company, you know, great, great customer service. You know, that's, that what they're going to promote. So I would be shocked uh, if there was a company that provided their negative reviews. I, I, I think about, um, you know, myself as a, as a college professor, um, you know, we get course evaluations at the end of every semester. And, you know, if I was to, to talk to my class the next semester about, you know, here's how well I did last semester. I wouldn't tell them about, yeah, so this student said I was terrible and this student said I wasn't funny and this student said the class was boring. Like, I, there was absolutely no way would I give those reviews. Uh, I would give just the reviews of the, the, the students who said, oh, he's great. The class was wonderful. Um, and, and that's what I think companies do here because, again, I, I would be just absolutely amazed. And it seems like the antithesis of what you would do from a PR standpoint of, you know, here's where we were terrible. Here's, here's um, you know, how bad our product is, according to these uh, customers. Uh, and, and so, yeah, I think if you're looking at the reviews that a company is providing on itself, even if they are trying to seem a little balanced, 
um, and trying to say, well, we're not just, we shouldn't just show them all of our best reviews. Uh, we should show them some negative ones. The negative ones are probably not going to be that bad. It, it's kind of reminiscent if you go into a job interview and, and you know, the, the hiring manager goes, well, what's your biggest weakness? Uh, and and the, the employee says, well, my biggest weakness is I just work too hard. Um, you know, it, it's kind of like, oh, so you're, you're, the bad thing about you is how hard you're going to work for me. Okay. Um, and, and yeah, so I can't see companies really putting out the, their biggest complaints or their most negative reviews if they put out any. Um, because I just, I just don't see it as something, um, unless it was, like you're saying, it was required in the UK. I just don't see it as something that is a good business practice to uh, kind of promote the, any negative uh, comments or reviews about your product, your service, your company, or your business. Check out thisconsumer.thisconsumer.com reviews. All the negative reviews that have been posted about this consumer on our website are published. Our views on it are the following. It is a consumer feedback. If consumer doesn't like something about us, we publicly share it and we take into account how do we fix our processes internally. Negative consumer feedback actually, I think, gives the roadmap for the company how to address in external communication that the company makes. The biggest problem, the biggest source of uh, reviews that we are getting is a miscommunication. A company put out a communication in some way. It could be through the sales process, it could be through the marketing process, it could be through a million of other ways in which company communicates and brands to the world, and then something went wrong in the how consumer understood the company. It is all about communication. Well, and sometimes things do happen, but it is in the hands of the company to fix the situation, to address the issue. So we are proponents of freedom of speech. We let people speak freely on our website. And from the very beginning, we put out the ruling, people can post negative things about this consumer and they are public. I think about the fact that there is an aspect of that that's beneficial. I mean, you want, you know, if you are, if you're a company that actually, just in general, if you're a company that wants to improve and provide a better service and provide a better product, you have to be willing to take criticism. I mean, this is literally true of anything. If you're a professional athlete, if you're a student, if you're a business, like you have to be willing to take constructive criticism. You know, there's obviously the criticism that, is, is pointless. You know, there's the criticism that is, that is just an attack. It's not meant to really do anything besides, you know, be an attack. But you have to accept criticism and be willing to improve if that's something that you want to do. Uh, you know, the, the flip side of it is, you know, you can go on to, uh, again, like you can think about something like Yelp and people are leaving reviews for a restaurant. And then you can see the, um, the, the owners or someone at that, that particular restaurant responding back to the criticism that's left. And sometimes it's like, you know, we apologize that you had that experience. Like that is not like how we want to do our business. Um, please give me a, send me an email here or give me a call. I'd like to help, you know, solve this issue. And, you know, again, like that's, I, I think people see that and, and they respect that. But I've also seen the opposite where, you know, you have the owner or you know, a person responding back and it's like, well, I don't think you ever came into our restaurant and that's not what we're like at all. So you don't know what you're talking about or, you know, leaving just comments like, well, you I remember you coming in and you were just rude to the waitress and like you didn't leave it. It's like now you just seem combative and you see like if you're in a service industry, like the last thing that anybody wants to deal with in a service industry is somebody who is combative or rude. And if you're kind of doing that on social media for the world to see, uh, you know, that that's going to not help at all. But I, I think I, I see what you're talking about. Um, I think there, again, there's tremendous value in it being able to accept criticism. 
We all know people in our personal lives who cannot accept criticism. I think we know people in our professional lives who cannot accept criticism or won't uh, are, are willing to accept criticism. Uh, and we see this kind of across the board, whether it's a celebrity, whether it's a politician. Um, you know, some people are, are take criticism very poorly. Um, some people are able to take criticism and use it to improve. Uh, and I think the people who are able to use it to improve generally are going to be more successful in the long term because they're they're kind of taking that step back and, and reviewing, you know, OK, like, what are we doing right? What are we doing wrong? Kind of doing that almost SWOT analysis of, you know, are, are we missing something? And if we're missing something, is is it something where there's a whole new marketplace that might be available to us because we didn't think about being engaged here or doing that. And, and that comes from sometimes having these outside, you know, opinions and voices and, and so forth, because internally there's only so many people, um, but externally there's seven plus billion. What is your recommendation to the business owners that do get from time to time negative reviews? Would you recommend those business owners, uh, managers, directors to respond to reviews, to respond to positive reviews, respond to negative reviews? Do you have a recommendation that you would make to business society as far as how to deal with review? Well, I don't think there's a one-size-fits-all way to kind of address that. I don't think there's a, a, a specific even rule of thumb on how to address that. Um, because if you, you you could talk about a business like Disney or you could talk about, you know, a local shoe repair shop. And, and those are two vastly different companies that are going to get different types of you know responses and reviews. I, I think if you're, you know, Disney, Disney has plenty of PR people. They have plenty of people in their communications department to deal with all sorts of complaints and criticisms and everything else. And they're also Disney and they don't care. They, they don't have to. Um, you know, if you are a local business owner, if you're a local mom and pop shop, if you're a local cobbler, um, you know, I think a lot of this comes down to, you know, where is the complaint made? What is the validity of the complaint? So, you know, if you're a local business, you know, many local businesses are going to have a social media presence. Um, is it a negative review on one of your social media pages? So, you know, it's a negative review on an Instagram post. Is a negative review on a Facebook post? Is a negative review on a tweet? Uh, that would be one area. Is it a negative review on, say, Google? Or if you're a restaurant, negative review on Yelp? That's sort of another one. If we're looking at that kind of, you know, smaller business or, you know, a, not not even necessarily just a, a one person business, but, you know, kind of a small business of maybe only a couple stores or a couple locations, you know, I think the big thing is to kind of look at what, first of all, is to look at where was it the complaint made um, and then to kind of really assess the validity of the complaint. So if you have a complaint made on your Facebook page of, you know, we got terrible service, you have a terrible product, whatever it is. One, you've got to kind of make a determination. Was this really a customer? Uh, and if it was, uh, you want to address that because this is now something that's been made publicly and you want to address it in terms of having a conversation with that person. Uh, my, my biggest recommendation, again, for smaller businesses that aren't going to be dealing with, you know, potentially billions of customers like Disney, um, you want to have a conversation with that person. Uh, but you don't want to have that conversation openly on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram. You want to have that conversation privately over email, over, you know, over the phone. Because one of the things that you can do and one of the great benefits that you can get is if you can turn that negative into a positive uh, and, and you get what we would call earned media. Uh, you know, you have somebody who complains and says, you know, I can't believe that I got this terrible you know, uh, product or service at your business. You say, hey, I'm really sorry that that happened. We'd love to have a conversation with you. Please email us here. Please call us here. You have the email conversation. You have the phone conversation. You solve the problem or figure out what the issue is or you explain how you're going to address that moving forward. You compensate the customer in some way. And then 
when that customer comes in, hopefully you have improved that thing that you said you would, or you give them a different impression in their mind of what kind of business, what kind of company you are. Because for the most part, when people go online to complain, they're, they're, they understand that they're a large part of it is just kind of shouting out you know, at the ocean. They don't expect the ocean to respond. Um, but when they, you do get a response and it's a genuine response, um, you know, it can mean a lot. Now, you do have to assess what the issue was. You have to assess who the person is. You know, is this somebody who has a legitimate complaint? Uh, is this somebody who, you know, for sure was in your business or, you know, has done business with your company? Um, but you, the best thing that you can do is always turn that negative into a positive. Um, on a personal experience, you know, I've seen that where uh, a few years ago, I actually had a pair of shoes. Uh, I was I parked, I got into campus, I was walking to campus, I was walking to my building, and I had a pair of shoes, and the soles fell off just <laughs> while I was walking. Um, and let, but the, the top of the shoe stayed on because it was tied, so I basically walked the rest of the way of the building with no soles just on my socks. Um, got the class. Showed my students, they had a nice laugh. Uh, and I tweeted out, you know, to the company, I was like, hey, my shoes fell apart. And they were like, we're so sorry. Uh, we'd like to move this to a DM. We, you know, started to go back and forth through uh, direct messaging on Twitter. And they're like, we're really sorry about this. That's actually an older pair of shoes, but, you know, we, we feel bad. Uh, we'd like to send you a gift certificate for $75 for you to get a new pair of shoes. And I was like, that's awesome. So, of course, I tweeted out. Hey, you know, this happened and you know, the, the company uh, is responding and you know, they offered me the 75. I went to their website and I found a pair of shoes I liked for 125. So, you know, I still wound up spending more money than they gave me um, and you know, continue to buy their shoes. So it, it's one of those things where you, you, you can turn a negative into a positive. You can turn somebody into an, an activist for you. Uh, if you are sincere about addressing the criticism, and that, again, goes back to being willing to accept criticism, um, but willing to accept it. And then most importantly, if you can, you want to take that conversation offline and offline can also be email. Um, but, you know, a phone conversation, email, something to where it's not just constantly like these posts being made for others to join in on. You know, you don't like if it's on a Facebook page. You don't want someone leaving a negative post, you responding, they respond, you respond. Other people start to see it. They start contributing to the conversation as well. One, even if they are a supporter of yours, you don't want you one of your supporters attacking this person because now they're on the defensive and they're going to become even more adamant about how bad your company is. Or two, you don't want someone else to see it and go, you know what? I also had a terrible experience there. They are a terrible company. Let's get them kind of like. You don't want them to gang up on you. So instead, you want to switch that to, you know, like I said, you want to switch to offline as best as possible, um, even if offline is email or direct messaging. I think the big thing is that, uh, and, and I talk to my students about this, we look at the fact that sort of media literacy was something that kind of developed over time, you know, in, in the you know, pre-social media days, we expected people to become more media literate as they got older. Um, and it was important because they were buying products, they were buying homes, they were becoming parents and everything else. Uh, but we don't live in a time and an age where we can just allow people to slowly develop that media literacy. It's something that they need very early on because of how impacted they are by social media, by media messages, by the bombardment of media messages. You know, it's not just it's, it's not like when I grew up, when you grew up and it was just there's the TV, you turn off the TV and you go wander off and, and you're digitally unconnected. You're unconnected from the media world. Uh, we are 24 seven connected. We're getting the notifications, the push notifications. We're looking at our phone first thing in the morning, last thing at night while we're eating, uh, while we're sitting at a stoplight. And the need for media literacy and for individuals to be more media literate has never been more important than I think it is in this very moment. And it's something that it needs to be addressed in K through 12 education. It needs to be addressed in college education. It needs to be addressed by parents to their children. Parents need to be media literate to teach media literacy to their children. Um, and it's just such a vital thing when it comes to 
you know, looking at finding which product to buy, which reviews to trust, dealing with fake news, dealing with, um, you know, information, whether it is something as simple as do I trust the weather that I just got to should I get a vaccine um, that is that has killed millions of people around the world. And, you know, when we don't when we're not media literate, we're much more likely to believe in conspiracy theories. We're much more likely to believe in information that's not true uh, because we don't know who to trust and how to accurately gauge information. So. Andrew, I want to thank you very much for sharing your thoughts, your tips with consumers. Guys, everyone, thank you for watching. You're welcome to share your thoughts on the topics of the social media. I really enjoyed today's conversation with Andrew. Please subscribe to our channel to follow consumer news and more expert videos. Mm -hmm.